The Calgary Stampede is one of the biggest parties in the country, and its wild reputation was earned right from the start. Guy Weedick paid bonuses to whoever could do the wildest stunt or the best publicity stunt. So it was far more chaotic <laughs> in 1923 than it is today. Every July, millions of people take in the Calgary Stampede. From the Midway to the world-class rodeo, it all started with one man who attended an exhibition more than a hundred years ago. Guy Wiedek was the founder of the Calgary Stampede. He was an American showman. He was a trick roper who traveled North America and through Europe with the Wild West shows. In many ways, I'd say Guy Wiedek is really the founder of Calgary's spirit and who we are today. He arrived here in 1908. And he was really inspired by the city. He saw that it was a city in transition. There was still some of the old west flair from the early days of the cowboys, but there was also this modern transition. People were dressing more modernly. They were listening to modern music. It was really a time when Calgary could become kind of a, a service industry for the agriculture, or it could think bigger. And because I arrived at that time, Calgary thought bigger and has thought bigger ever since. He was able to convince four of the big ranchers of the day to stake him should the thing lose money, and uh, they certainly uh, got behind him. I mean, this was pretty wild territory out in those days. I mean, people just by coming out here were taking a risk. So to put on something like the Stampede really wasn't that much of a stretch, I don't think, or they were all, all game to do it. And so he brought together Mexican vaqueros, who were wonderful ropers, but he wanted it to be a Western story. So he got permission to bring in the First Nations people from the local reserves, which is amazing. They came in full costume, very proud to be there. And the parade was, I don't know how many miles long. And people came, they didn't know what a stampede was because it was coined for Calgary. So they didn't even know what they were coming for, but he created such excitement and such enthusiasm that people came and said, you had to be there. When I say he's a contemporary guy, he really is kind of that entrepreneur and media guy who's very savvy on how to get the stories out. He was in New York one time and he saw that there was going to be a big, um, a ship was landing, there's some famous people on it. So he wandered down there and he had his big 10 gallon hat on and his rope and he just started roping people in. Nobody even knew who he was and they said, well, who are you? And they said, well, I'm Guy Wittick from the Calgary Stampede. Nobody had even heard, this is New York, they hadn't heard of it. But he saw that media opportunity and never missed one. The 1912 Stampede was a blockbuster event. It was certainly exciting, but it was also a major learning process. So for example, there was actually no infield blocking the event. So if you go today, it's this sort of defined arena. And they didn't have that in 1912. So it took the cowboys to the other side of the grandstand to rope their calf, for example. So people in the stands couldn't actually see what was happening. So they learned their lesson and after that they, they create an infield. Uh, the other thing that was unique in the early years is that you had to ride your bucking horses to a standstill. So when Tom Three Persons won the bucking horse competition, it took him 10 minutes, roughly, to bring Cyclone to a standstill. So it was not sort of the action-packed adventure that we think of today. 10 minutes, you know, roughly per rider. The Strobel airship was effectively a very famous blimp of the day. It traveled around North America to different exhibitions showing off flight. And so in 1908, it came to Calgary as part of the Dominion Exhibition. The Dominion Exhibition traveled from city to city in Canada. They had a midway, they had a parade, they had a lot of entertainment. And one of the key entertainment pieces was Strobel's airship and so it would do flights I think three times a day and sort of wow the crowds. Uh, and so Strobel's airship comes and it's wowing the crowd until on American Day, as it was called. So it was on July 4th. Uh, and Strobel airship went up, a gust of wind hit it and it actually crashed against the Stampede Grandstand, lit on fire. And that was the end of Strobel's airship. The 
exhibition, which had run all throughout the war, really um, wanted to promote the war effort. So when 1919 comes around, it was a really natural fit, especially considering the interest in flight that the exhibition had shown throughout, that they brought in two local war aces, Fred McCall and Wilfred Wop McKay, as he was known, to perform aerials every day over the grandstand to sort of wow the crowds. Ernie Richardson was the manager of the Stampede. He was a very good businessman, but I think even he was startled by Guy sometimes. He had two young sons, and they wanted to fly over the Stampede to see what was going on. And uh, Freddie McCall came in and took them on this, this ride. And his engine stalled. And so he faced two choices. One of them was to land in the infield where there were actual races going on, or the other one was to land on somewhere on the midway. So he managed to land on the merry-go-round, if you could imagine. That wouldn't be my first choice, but he did that, and that became part of the legend of the stampede and the excitement. You never knew what was going to happen there. Early 1920s, the West suffers an incredible recession. Grain prices plummet after the First World War and it hurts the exhibition. And so Ernie Richardson, the manager of the exhibition, starts trying to think outside the box. And so the brainwave that they come up with in 1921 is to hold a winter carnival. And the signature event at this winter carnival is going to be ski jumping. And so they actually construct a 75 foot ski jump on the top of the grandstand. It was a steel ski jump. Um, they brought in snow from around the city and they ran this competition. They had something like 11,000 people come out to watch, which for January 1921, I think is a pretty good turnout. They brought in some of the top athletes from North America. They came up from Minnesota, they came from BC to participate. And at least in that first year, it seemed to go okay. Um, 1922, they try and do it again, but there's a massive Chinook in the city. So they have to bring truckloads of snow from Lake Louise in just to make the event work. But then it freezes. Like we get one of those bitter January colds. And so then no one shows up and people can barely get down the track because it's all, all ice. So thank goodness there were never any major injuries, but there were also not a lot of reports of people actually landing their jumps. In 1923, when they decided to combine the exhibition and the stampede, Guy Weedy thought, we can't just do that, we have to do something else. So he invented um, chuck wagon racing. And so he went out and he talked to the local ranchers, got them on board, they figured out how they were gonna do it, and they put on this new event. Oh, it was crazy. The person, the driver who won had to, it was the one who had first smoke in the infield. So you, uh, started with your chuck wagon loaded, raced around the track, unloaded your supplies, and then had to actually start a fire in the infield. People didn't know the rules, they didn't know what they were supposed to do. They, the outriders were, got confused with each other and the, the rules of going around were confused. So it was, just, it was just a complete mess. So nobody really knew what the rules were and what they wanted. But they all knew they had a wonderful time and everybody loved. People stayed even in, into the dark, just wondering what was going on. Another event that started in 1923 was the wild cow milking. And uh, what they used to do is you had to rope a wild cow and one guy would mug and then the roper would go and, and milk the cow and bring it up. Well, Guy Wiedek, uh, because the Calgary Stampede had such a big infield, uh, he was paying a $5 bonus to whoever could milk the cow closest to the grandstand crowd. Jack Morton, to get the extra five bucks, which was a king's ransom in 1923, roped the cow, drug him out the gate and up onto the stage right in front of it just to get the, the five dollar. But those are the kind of things that Jack Morton used to do. There's also Friday the 13th, 1923, when Wild Horse Jack Morton and his wagon and all of his thing came roaring downtown Calgary. They set up right uh, on 8th Avenue and uh, pulled out the stoves and they fired him up and started cooking up pancakes. You know, who wants them? Who's hungry? And of course the crowd lined up and uh, that was the official start of the pancake breakfast which has become an iconic event at an iconic event and synonymous with the Calgary Stampede and it all started on Friday the 13th.
Guy um, had been in the vaudeville circuit, and um, he was married to a very strong-minded, very accomplished um, performer, uh, Florence Ledoux. And um, he saw there was an interest in, in women in performing in these rough, rough sports. They could do trick riding, they did bronc riding, they did a whole bunch of very um, edgy sports now. Lucille Mahal was an early rodeo competitor, and Teddy Roosevelt, the American president, actually made the term cowgirl famous about her because he saw her competing and was so impressed by her skills that he, you know, called her a real cowgirl. And that's what these women all were of the day. So Blanchette was a rancher, Ledoux was on the circuit trick roping and competing, and Mulhall was also, you know, competing in all of these different events and, and winning and, you know, being very successful at it. In 1929, in, at the Pendleton Roundup, a woman performer who was a, I think she was a calf roper, she was killed by being pulled behind the, the horse, she, her foot got caught up. So that created a lot of um, worry about the, the fragility of women and whether they were able to compete. Gene Autry was the head of the Rodeo Association at that time and he really felt that that wasn't a good place for women. Well, one of the things a lot of historians agree on now is that um, suffrage started in the West because women and men had to work side by side to make life work. And I think that in the West, women were very much considered working people. They were uh, worked out on the ranch, they pulled calves, they did all that kind of work. They had to, but also they were also really good at it. From airships and ski jumps to high-flying war aces, the Stampede and Exhibition brought the world to Calgary's doorstep. That adventurous spirit is still a very big part of the city today. In Calgary, the whole city, every neighborhood, every church, every synagogue, every mosque, you know, they're having pancake breakfast, they're all getting into the spirit of it and celebrating our Western heritage. I like that, I like the time-honored tradition, and, you know, we've talked about a few guys, uh, some colorful characters that have been involved with the Stampede. And those are great stories that you can tell. And chances are there's a lot of better ones that you can't. Riding through the western sky, you can toss your worries aside. With the clouds rolling gently and sunshine aplenty on a trail that leads straight into the sky. Mm -hmm. 